Yeah, camera's working. That's good. <laughs> so now what I got to do is turn off the yeah. turn off the uh, blur mount dash. Okay. This we're going to talk. Okay, so the audio, the microphone is set as the anchor. That's not correct. It has to be the USB device. So I'm just wondering. This is for the Zoom session. No, it's a Zoom configure. Yeah. So, Testing, testing. One, two, three, testing. Should I turn this off? Hello, testing. Okay. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Okay. I still miss Mike. Um, then we'll go on with opening. Jay. I did my usual Google to find some pithy sayings and remarks about uh, effective altruism, and I discovered there are uh, uh, EA groups around America that meet just the way we do, and other free thinkers and things. But I did uh, find some things that related to altruism in general. And uh, one of those should be familiar to many of you because it's uh, by Richard Dawkins from his book, The Selfish Gene. And he said, let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. Let us understand what our own selfish genes are up to because we may then at least have the chance to upset their designs, something that no other species has ever aspired to. This next piece, if you're well-read, or even if you're not well-read, you probably read from, remind, remind, remember this from high school. It's from a book we all, I think, were required to read at one time. It says, lawyers are all right, I guess, but it doesn't appeal to me. I mean, they're all right if they go around saving innocent guys' lives all the time, but you don't do that kind of stuff if you're a lawyer. All you do is make a lot of dough and play golf and play bridge and buy cars and drink martinis and look like a hot shot. And besides, even if you did go around saving guys' lives and all, how would you know if you did it because you really wanted to save lives or because you did it because what you really wanted to do was be a terrific lawyer with everybody slapping you on the back and congratulating you in court when the goddamn trial was over, the reporters and everybody, the way it is in the movies. How would you know you, were, you weren't being a phony? The trouble is you wouldn't know. Anybody remember where that's from? J.D. Salinger, Catcher in the Rye. 
Now, this one, I'm going to maybe uh, tweak uh, our speaker, Hugh, a little bit, because it raises, I think, uh, a minor concern about intel effective altruism. And it says, an old joke about economists explains why effective altruism chooses its causes. An economist, Homer, loses his key in a dark alley. Adam, his friend, finds him there searching under the one single streetlight. Adam asks Homer, did you lose your key here? He responds, no. So Adam then asks, why are you searching here if you lost your key elsewhere? Homer responds, because this is where the light is. And finally, in, in the little more humorous vein, P.J. O'Rourke once said, everybody wants to save the earth, but nobody wants to help mom do the dishes. Okay, we're working on um, some technical challenges, but hopefully we're getting there. So in the meantime, I am happy to be able to present longtime friend of the Ethical Humanist Society of the Triangle, Hugh Giblin. Hugh is a writer and an activist. He writes poetry and nonfiction articles and has published a book regarding corruption and international labor union in D.C. in the connections to, yes, the Chicago Mafia. That story is fascinating, but as Hugh has already given us a talk about those experiences, he'll be discussing Peter Singer's philosophy on giving, one which he subscribes to himself and tries to live by. Please welcome Hugh Giblin. Thank you, and uh, thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a a grim subject in a way. Um, and I think it's um, somewhat challenging. Excuse me. Last time I was at this podium, I was reading poetry and I lost my voice. And if I do it again today, <laughs> anyhow, I've been taking little pills that are supposed to help. So this is gonna be a book uh, written by Peter Singer um, and it's called The Life You Can Save. Um, like I say, I think you're going to be challenged by this talk. Um, and you might find the premise difficult to accept. But nonetheless, I think since we subscribe to an ethical life, oh my God, my voice, um, it is a worthwhile, <clears throat> necessary topic to consider. Peter Singer is an Australian moral philosopher of applied ethics. He's now an emeritus bioethics professor at Princeton University. He has been a prolific writer in applied ethics from a secular utilitarian viewpoint. He's an atheist. He wrote Animal Liberation in 1975, which, in which he argued for vegetarianism. He also wrote Famine, Affluence, and Morality on World Poverty. The Sydney Herald rated him among Australia's 10 most influential public intellectuals. And he has been honored as a leading humanist. Singer's institutional education culminated at Oxford. Politically, he is on the left, author of a book called the Darwinian left. That goes. And a strong environmentalist. In 2010, Singer signed a petition renouncing his right of return to Israel because it, quote, is a form of racist privilege that abets the colonial oppression of the Palestinians, unquote. He has been controversial on his views on euthanasia and disability, 
and uh, has been canceled at a number of um, uh, venues for uh, speaking. So in 2021, he was awarded a million dollar prize called the Bergeron Prize, and he promptly donated that to charity. He, I've read, I checked up on him, you know, to go see whether he practices what he preaches. He gives a 30 to 40% of his income to charity. I find him very realistic and not like many philosophers wedded to the abstract. He's a leading advocate of effective altruism. Effective altruism is a 21th century philosophical and social movement that advocates, advocates using evidence and reason to figure out how to benefit others as much as possible and taking action on that basis. So effective altruism is advocated and supported by a couple of characters you know, Elon Musk and Sam Bankman Freed and a number of other uh, a number of other Silicon Valley types. Almost 8,000 people have committed 46 billion dollars to this cause. But you have to subtract out 16,000 from Sam Bankman Freed because his cryptocurrency organization failed and he went to jail. So initially, it spent a billion dollars on global health, including mental health, biosecurity, pandemic prevention, causes of poverty, climate change, and all good stuff. Um, however, now it is getting criticism for moving this focus to what is called, it's an unusual term, long-termism, which is concerned with things like AI and space exploration. So critics are saying it's neglecting immediate needs for long-term gains. So I was initially intrigued um, and impressed um, by uh, EA, but now I become more skeptical because they seem more like a bunch of immature guys on an ego trip, uh, thinking they're the only ones that can save the world and are rational in doing so. You know, I'm sure most nonprofits are try to be net rational in giving away um, money to charity. So they work with a, char a charity monitor called GiveWell, which from its research recommends only four organizations, you know, out of the tens of thousands that are out there to give money to. I think that precludes a, a lot of fine charitable groups, groups that I'm aware of, you know, like Doctors Without Borders and Oxfam um, some really, re and uh, World Food Program. Um, so anyhow, EA claims in the past it has saved 200,000 lives from malaria, has prevented chronic parasite infections by treating 25 million cases, and given 5 million people clean drinking water. So this is all good stuff. They've also done some animal welfare work. But, you know, they're not doing much of that anymore. So it has worked extensively in AI safety. They seem to be obsessed with AI safety, you know, an extension like, uh, um, and uh, they, they're working on things like civilization recovery, you know, underground food uh, supplies and fuel supplies. They have this sort of sense of an apocalypse that's going to occur any day and they need to be prepared for it. Uh, their focus for a lot of the work uh, seems to be Nigeria, which, of course, is, is one of the poorest countries in the world. They, you know, these numbers that I gave you on, on what they've accomplished, they're not all that impressive because, you know, the, the World Food Program feeds 15 billion people in a year. And, uh, you know, so that, that's, and Doctors Without Borders do 16 million medical con consultations. Um, so there are a lot of organizations that are doing, have done as much as they have done in terms of numbers. So critics say that, um, well, here, here's what they're interested in. Their interest, according to The Guardian, transhumanism, space colonization, concern over power-hungry AI, 
life extension, you know, these sorts of um, things are what they're now um, concerned about. They feel the vast population of future generations are more important than the current one. You know, this is sort of taking the philosophy of utilitarianism to really an extreme, where you try to do the most good for the most people, uh, according to that philosophy. So critics say, and I agree, they have gotten away from their humanist origins. There are some people who have done extraordinary things in giving. What impressed me was a couple running a small business who have given away $30,000 from their business every year and kept only 28,000 for themselves. And a guy who really took things in his own hands, he went to a village of a thousand people who had a, didn't have uh, water. They had to walk three or four miles for water and the water that they were getting uh, was polluted and some of them were dying. So this guy, bought a well for a thousand bucks to take care of that need and now they all have clean drinking water at, um, at their convenience so i would love to do something like that and um and actually researching I mean, i've been aware of this organization for some time and donated to it you know you've heard of heifer international you can buy goat you can buy chickens and things for 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 well you actually buy a well for 750 bucks, I'm gonna do it, yeah. All right, so if we are ready, um, I think that Singer can explain his philosophy much better than I can. So there's like a, a 22 minute YouTube um, Talk to Google. That was that's that. Yeah, I didn't even want to. Well, hey, it's me and I. Yeah, that's him. That's not Singer. That's the guy who did Yeah, but the problem is that was an hour, so it's probably not the right thing. No, I'm cutting it off at 20 minutes. Oh, okay. So it is the right thing. Yeah, I'm going to buy that. So I'm going to cut it off at this minute. She asked questions instead of talking. Okay. This is actually, do we want the post chapters on? Might make me share. Do we want to work? In the YouTube um, search bar, yeah. we, we searched um, the Life You Can Say Peter Singer talks at Google. And it's a, inside the YouTube, and it's a, it's a longer talk. It's 57 minutes, but he's only going to use some of it. But I can, I can well, see what it's 57. Yep. The life you can say, Peter Singer talks at Google. Okay. Good job. I think. Okay. What was the one that was on the Sorry, I forget. Okay, now what number? Hold on. Let me know when she Mm -hmm. I got it. I'm going to go. I'm going to start. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Steve, and I'm here to do that work. And we spend a uh, few times a team thinking about how to have something that we go. And if there's any spot, it's likely that you also have a strong grip on this um, and using your own abilities to support us. That's why you are therefore thrilled that we need our support and honor. 
have to do the same thing as today. I'm a person who has devoted his life to the rational study of what it means to be good. Professor Singer is one of the most intellectual philosophers of life. Uh, he's the author of Animal Liberation, which is a landmark of the animal rights movement, um, also the author of Counting Metrics, the process work in the planet. He was appointed a uh, companion in the Order of Australia last year, and is personally motivated to come out with people who are sharing it. Um, I attribute uh, my own approach of giving them much good work. His most recent book, What Life Can Save, is like the creation of an organization that we've seen in the community sharing. The last thing we say, the book is, is going to be available after the talk. So let's all get here for a moment. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again for the introduction and for uh, arranging this. And thank you all for coming. And of course, that includes people in the other offices around the country. Uh, so, uh, this talk is really going to do um, two things. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a condensed version of the argument of the book that uh, we just mentioned, of the life of the and the premise uh, behind the argument for what we ought to be doing to do the most good at the moment, why we ought to be doing it. And then, uh, before I finish, I want to talk a little bit about the organization uh, because. To be transparent, one of the reasons that I'm here is that I do think that there are things people in the room with skills and resources that could certainly benefit the organization. And if you're interested in doing something for us in that way, that would be terrific. Uh, and I also want to leave plenty of time for discussion, um, so I won't speak for too long, but we will have a lot of time for QA. Okay, so. Let's start with the basic government. And I noticed as we were walking back from the lunch in the cafeteria thing, that we crossed the bridge over what looked like a pretty shallow meandering stream. So that'll do for the purpose of my example. Imagine that you're walking over that bridge and you see that a small child has fallen into the stream. And this child is too small to like to stand up in that stream uh, or to swim. Um, you, on the other hand, could easily wade in, and I assume that that stream is not more than white deep. So, you see the child in the stream, your first thought perhaps is uh, where are the parents who uh, brought this child here, or the babysitter, or wherever it is? Uh, why, why aren't they pulling out a child? But you look around, and it's one of those unusual moments, perhaps on the Google campus, where there's nobody else there. Uh, <laughs> that's just you and the child. So, what do you do? The next thought is, well, I could easily jump into that stream, no danger for me, and um, pull out the child. If I don't do that, the child will probably drown. Great. But, you know, what about the clothes you wear? Um, you just put on some of your most expensive shoes, let's say, today, and you've got time to get them off, or a really nice suit. So, you're going to get ruined by jumping into that stream. Uh, is, is that a reason why? It's something that would, would justify you in saying, well, look, it's not really any of my business, it's not my child. I certainly didn't push the child into the stream or anything like that, so I'm not responsible. So rather than ruin my fancy shoes, why don't I just go on my way? If you think about that, I hope that you agree with me that that would be wrong. But if you did you think that way and did you go on your way and maybe later you heard about you did a small child to the stream? Um, that you would have done something seriously wrong. Some people would do stronger things than that, say that what you've done is really outrageous or inhuman. But let's just say before you've done something wrong. Um, that's most people's reaction to that example. And I think clearly it's it's, it's the right reaction to have. And I think probably most of us, maybe not everybody here, would have actually saved that child in those circumstances. But before you give yourself too much credit for saying I would have saved such a child, think about the global situation that we're in. We're in a situation where there are over a billion people living in extreme poverty, as defined by the World Bank, which is living on less than $1.25. Per day, that's a 
This would be a bit of just adjusted for inflation. It's also a question from our parity figure, so it needs to be adjusted the other in the other direction generally for currency to go to But let's say, you know, suppose you said two dollars a day would be for those currencies would be pretty fair. And one result of that kind of extreme poverty is that children die. Um, UNICEF's uh, most recent report showed the number of children dying from preventable poverty related diseases in 2011 was 6.9 million. Now, UNICEF said this is really good news because in 1990 it was 12 million. And even as recently as 2008, when the book The Life You Can Save in its original hardback version went to press, uh, the figure I quote there is uh, 9.8 million. So um, it, it is a figure that's coming down and actually coming down more quickly in the recent years. And that's very good news. But 6.9 million a year is almost 19,000 per day. So about 19,000 children are dying every day from preventable causes. Uh, these causes are things like uh, malaria, uh, measles, diarrhea, pneumonia. Uh, we can prevent malaria by providing uh, insecticide treated bed nets. We can prevent measles by immunization. We can prevent diarrhea by uh, providing sanitation. Or we can prevent death from diarrhea by a very simple oral rehydration therapy. Um, so these are things that with more resources going into this area, we can prevent. And yet we don't. Uh, oh, we, we are still, to some extent we are preventing it, but we are still allowing 90,000 children to die every day from these causes. And those of us living in affluent nations uh, and who are not right at the bottom of the uh, economic uh, hierarchy in developing nations have enough, more than enough, to meet all of our basic needs and beyond that to live a enjoyable, pleasant quality of life and still have money that is over for things that by most specialty imagination nations are necessary. Things like buying a fancy expensive pair of shoes when you could quite comfortable in a certain sense of care. Or if you do not go thing, um, maybe it's going on a guy holiday overseas, maybe it's just buying a fancy car, um, maybe it's uh, people here with a lot of, of high tech gadgets that you don't really need for your work. Um, you, know, you, can, you can pick your own luxury, but I'm sure that you can find one. And uh, so that gives you the opportunity to save lives. For instance, you could donate to the Against Malaria Foundation, uh, which is a charity that has been rated by Givewell, I'll tell you more about Givewell in a moment, as uh, the most highly effective organization in the uh, anti poverty, anti international poverty field. And they will use that money to buy bed nets and distribute them, which is a proven way of reducing. Malaria, uh, saving the lives of children, also reducing the number of cases of people who get very sick from malaria, which is a pretty unpleasant disease, uh, even if eventually they recover. So, the question that I want you to think about is um, if I agree that it would be wrong not to jump into that stream to save the child, isn't it also wrong? not to be doing something significant to save the children who are dying further away from us. Not so visible to do it, but when we know we have the means to do so. Because I don't think the distinction between being close at hand and being far away is really morally relevant. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that the fact that maybe, you know, one child is an American and the other child is an Indian or a Ghanaian or whatever else it might be, is not going to be a lot of relevant distinction. So what is supposed to make the difference? 
But a few things that you might think of, I try to release my aggression to your favorite objection, trying to mention it, but I mean, some people say things like, well, what can I do though about 90,000 children dying every day? Right? I could say that one child in the stream, no problem. But I can't say 90,000 children, even Bill Gates has been putting uh, many billions into it, and Warren Buffett uh, has not been able to stop that, but they may well have contributed, and I don't believe they have contributed to that production that I mentioned before. But um, you know, what if I do? There's still going to be roughly 90,000 children dying. But then I think it's surely the wrong way to look at it. It's not uh, whether you can solve the entire problem that is important. It's whether you can do something that is highly significant, highly important, like saving a child's life, as compared to what you will have to give up in order to do that. And uh, the fact that there will be other children still dying even if you do that is tragic, certainly. But it doesn't detract from the importance of what you've done. <coughs> you have to have a child life by a donation. If you're more likely to save several people's lives. And that surely is what's important. And the underlying principle, I think, is that we can do something that is as important, prevent something as bad happening. As a child is alive um, at a pretty minimal cost to ourselves, then I think we ought to do that. So um, that seems to me to be the most important point for that. Uh, now, some of you might also say, well, how can I be confident that I really can do that? Unlike the case of the child. I can't be confident that my money will be worth well using. A lot of people believe that uh, giving to NGOs is not a very effective thing to do because they have a cynical view of NGOs. They think that uh, NGOs typically are bureaucratic, inefficient, spend a lot of money on their administration or on uh, fundraising, and not very much gets to. Uh, program that is essential. Well, no doubt there are some organizations like that, but um, there are a lot of NGOs, and we shouldn't be interested in what the worst NGOs are like, or even what the average NGOs are like. What we should be interested in is, can we identify some really good effective NGOs and contribute to that? And the answer to that is yes, and it doesn't even require a huge amount of time and effort on your part. I mentioned uh, organizations, GiveWell, uh, GiveWell.org, uh, which was set up a few years ago to do this by a couple of guys who were working for a hedge fund, uh, making a lot of money, decided that they wanted to give some of it away. Uh, I didn't know who to give it to. Contacted some captains and said, Tell us what you would do if we gave you a significant amount of money. And found that what they got back was unsatisfactory. Right? It's vague, uh, got glossy brochures with photos of smiling kids, but not very much hard out. You can see the people who are in the business of analyzing companies for their hedge funds, they wanted something more specific. So they decided to go for that more systematic thing and see a couple of them. Like the hedge fund set up give well, and they've been looking very rigorously at uh, organizations. Uh, some people think, in fact, they stand too far, but it doesn't allow some really good organizations to qualify. But um, what they've got at the moment on the website, they've screened hundreds of organizations, and they've got actually just three that they're uh, recommending, and the Against Malaria Foundation is one of them. Uh, so they regard that as a suitably transparent organization that has demonstrable scientifically based evidence of the good that it's achieving, uh, and uh, they're recommending that as, as one of the organizations. So we can just take that as an example. And if that exists and there is scope for more funding, and there is, because that's what I think it's good well looked at, uh, then that's something that 
did do remains the good. So I think that the case for saying that we ought to be doing something like this uh, as an ethical case is really very strong. Uh, again, you can present objections or reasons that you think you think that it's not. Um, I've heard a few over the years I've been presenting this case. I haven't really seen anything that's convinced me that there's a serious hole in the argument. What is true, I think, is that the argument has um, a psychological difficulty in motivating people to give it, motivating some people to give it, um, because we, I think, have evolved to respond to individuals close to us, because they are the world of consideration in which we evolved. Most of our evolutionary history, we could help people in our own small group, and we did that, but we couldn't really help strangers, or we didn't want that agent to do so. So we didn't. Uh, now we live in a different world where we easily can help strangers, and we can know about strangers in the, and so that story has changed, but we have not changed uh, in an emotional way. That's, I think, true and unfortunate, but we don't have to only be guided by that instinctive emotional response here. Uh, I'm sure people in this room and, uh, and, and the other are particularly used to thinking in other terms, to reasoning your way to conclusions, to analyzing information. And I think we should regard this as a combination of the head and the heart, so that we want, uh, you know, we, we have something to do with people who can understand the idea of helping strangers. And with our head, we can appreciate that they are people who lives matter. They are people who have interests like we do, who want to go on living, parents who want their children to survive as well, and people who can suffer as we can, and that matters just as much as our own suffering. Nothing especially privileged about us from a broader moral point of view that means that our suffering matters somebody else's suffering. Doesn't matter. So I think we we can use our capacity to reason and argue to reach the conclusion that there is something that we're already doing about this, and in fact we have the opportunity to do it. So that's really the uh, the essential argument uh, of the book. Um, it also then raises the question: So how much should I be doing? Does this mean that I should not spend anything on anything that's luxury or not, not something that I really need? And the answer to that question, I think, is sort of actually a difficult one. In one sense, I'm tempted to say, you know, yes, really, that is what it means. And to the extent that you're not doing that, you are doing something wrong. But at the same time, I know that I'm not living according to such demanding standards, and I think very, very few people actually are plainly enough to do that. So I think we can, in a way, take a somewhat more relaxed standard and say, look, let me do something reasonably significant, and perhaps if I get comfortable with that, work up to a higher standard more gradual. But as long as I feel I'm doing something quite significant, I'm doing perhaps one way that some people look at it and say, suppose that others in my situation are giving this much, would that be enough to really deal with this problem of the 90,000 children dying every day unnecessarily? Uh, that's one way you can try to work out it So what I mean in the book and on the website, you like to say, but oh, uh, I've got a scale which is progressive. Uh, that starts off quite low with around 1% of your income, um, gets up to around 5% when you get to around uh, $100,000, that is the US dollar, um, people living in this country, and moves up but actually sort of pops out at uh, about a third of people who are earning uh, over a million dollars a year. Uh, and that seems to me the scale which on the one hand doesn't really impose any great hardship on people. Uh, the lower level is giving quite little, um, and at the upper level, if you're earning a million dollars a year, I don't think it's going to be hard to give away 
300 odd thousand to figure out any left. Uh, and uh, then if you do try to work out sums of uh, what would this map to everybody in the Amazon world is here, then it does look like we would really have enough to virtually eliminate screen problems. And then again, completely eliminate it. Places you can't really be effective in places that have corrupt or oppressive governments, you can't make changes or they'll be thrown into the civil war. But you could change the world so that there is no longer, there are no longer a division of people living next to poverty, and uh, so that the number of children going to these preventable causes uh, would drop to, let's say, uh, and I think that is a real possibility uh, over the next decade. So that would be a reasonable way of calculating to a, to a nice thing. What might be enough to be able to feel good about what they're doing and to have uh, some reasonable self esteem based on what you're giving. And also, and I think this is part of it, to feel that you've done something meaningful and significant with your life. I think that's looking at people who do this. Um, that's something that I've found that I've felt myself, that uh, it's easy in a party like this to get back into a lifestyle where uh, you earn money, you buy consumer goods with it, uh, you enjoy it, using them and spending them, then that's over, and what are you going to do next? Well, you can earn more and you can buy more consumer goods, um, and then you can do the same and it goes on and on. But in the end, it's not uh, truly satisfying, I think that's a phenomenon in a lot of fields. Whereas if you're contributing to something really important uh, that is making a permanent difference to the world, a permanent difference to good, obviously, uh, you can end up with a more meaningful, more fulfilled, and satisfied life. There is some research that suggests that people giving to charity does improve their own happiness with their life. So that's really. Uh, so the crux uh, of what I want to say to you about the, the argument. Now, uh, in terms of what we're doing here, and uh, when I say we, uh, so I published the book a few years ago. Uh, I had a friend who was had a bit of knowledge about setting up websites, and she said uh, we should build a website that goes with the book, not just to promote the sales of the book, but to spread the message of the book and to get people to pledge to give according to the scale that we suggest in the book, to give them information about that, to provide them with regularly updated information about what are organizations that are worth giving to, and generally to build that community of people who share this idea and to try to change the culture on a larger scale so that. Giving to reduce global poverty to help those who are so much uh, less fortunate than we are becomes an accepted part of what it is just to be a decent person, live an actual life. And uh, so, uh, with that up, we like got the website set up, and then more people came and people did pledge to give according to that uh, uh, scale, and quite a few of them gave us contact details. And so we built up a community of people supportive of this. And now more recently, other people said, well, we need to go further, not just have this website, but actually to use this information to build an organization, to do more in the way of um, spreading the message, uh, marketing through media, and in whatever other opportunities we have to get this idea as essentially a way of living in alternative consumer to the consumer society to get this out there and get this better known. So uh, one of the people that's in the audience, Charlie Bristler, uh, here who has a lot of experience in marketing and has a PhD in social psychology, but then went into uh, the menswear industry and spent some time as president of a major national menswear chain uh, and is now helping me and uh, some others in the national city in England too, to set this organization up to get uh, 501.
Uh -huh. Thank you. So that's um, Peter Singer's um, philosophy. Um, and first, when I read it, it seemed like a, a very demanding, strong ethical um, requirement. But as you can see from um, his talk, that it comes down to um, a pretty reasonable way of um, trying to deal with uh, some of the terrible suffering that's taking place in, the li in life. Um, I don't want to be redundant here by reading some of the things you've already heard. Um, so, you know, libertarians will say that um, we don't have any real um, requirement, ethical requirement to help other people unless we've done them some harm. And then, of course, we do. Um, evaluating harm can be a very complicated effort. You know, should we say that uh, the harm caused by the United States as being the greatest polluter in the world and what they've done to vulnerable third world countries, um, isn't that something that should be remedied? Or what so many corporations have done to harm people in the world. Shouldn't there be remuneration for that? I, I think they could find positive reasons for that. And he said the charity begins at home adage uh, is something that most of us subscribe to. You know, if it, if it were a question of giving $100 to UNICEF or feeding your children, well, the obvious, there's an obvious choice there. I mean, it's, but, um, as he indicated, um, my statistics are a little different. Maybe they're more current. But 10,000 die, children die every night from hunger and malnutrition. That's 3.1 in a year. You know, people will shake their heads at that statistic, but um, not many do something about it. Uh, you can get cynical um, or blasé about you know, what goes on, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, which has been going on all my life, um, decades. And you get to think, um, well, this is the norm. This is the way it is. It's never going to change. But um, you can't give up on dying children. So 1.5 million die of diarrhea every year. 1.5 million die from vac vaccine preventive diseases every year. 608,000 die from malaria every year, which he talked about. And, and on and on it goes. Um, a simple solution of sugar and salt and water, which cause cents, I mean pennies, can stop diarrhea. A vaccine can be as low as a dollar a dose. Nets can prevent malaria um, at $10 a net. There's a group that's cleverly called nothing but nets, which is sort of a basketball term. So the all things you can contribute to. Um, I don't know how he measures poverty, but the best way to measure poverty that I've found is something called multidimensional poverty, which is at 18% in the world. That's 1.1 billion people out of out of 6.1 billion. Roughly half of those are in Sub-Saharan Africa and half are children. So multidimensional poverty is, is, is a much more accurate evaluation of simply income. You know, in, in the U.S., the poverty level that we use is 24,860 for a family of three, 14,580 for an individual. That's a farce. That's a joke. I mean, who can get along? with that kind of money uh, in the United States. Um, Multidimensional poverty takes into account nutrition, health, clean water, sanitation, education, electricity, housing, education, environment, and income. So overall, poverty is decreasing worldwide. Um, but the prediction is that still, at that 2037% of the population or 
600 million people will still be in poverty. So on average, multidimensional poverty rates here in the U.S. for whites is 10.4%, moderately high among blacks, 14.8%, and Asians, 16.5%. Rather startlingly to me, Latinos are 34.7%, which just confounds me. Okay, let's see. How we are doing before I'm kicked off this podium. So here are some myths from the Brookings Institute. The U.S. gives more than any other country for foreign aid. That's a very popular belief. The U.S. gives more money, but as a percentage of GDP, he ranks near the bottom. Another myth, um, is that Democrats are better at giving foreign aid than Republicans. The reverse is true. I find that, I have to check that out. I, I, I'm hard to believe. And, uh, um, and you know, um, another myth is foreign aid goes to corrupt governments. I'm sure that happens, but agencies are smart enough to try to avoid that. I mean, they've been dealing with these governments for a long time. So uh, <clears throat> I, I passed around um, some pictures. I, I don't know how many of you did not get a picture of the starving child and the vulture waiting for the child to die. But I want to talk about that a little bit. It's really, it's, it's really quite interesting. Um, so if, if you're wondering whether I practice what I preach, a singer says that one should get examples of their life, uh, if they're talking about it. So hopefully this is not self-aggrandizement, but maybe some of that, uh, but um, for what it's worth, this is what I do. Um, so back in the 80s, I was making $75,000 a year, which was pretty good back then. Um, and I was on an expense account and I was on the road for six years. 95% of the time, my, my office was in, um, my base was in Washington, D.C. at the International Union. So I banked my check, you know, all my personal expenses, housing, food, were all, all taken care of. Um, and so when I left the union, I had $360,000 saved. And um, since that time, I've given away two thirds of it to charities and causes. I recently also lost 10,000 in the stock market. Don't ask me for advice on the stock market because everybody else made money and I lost money. Um, but, you know, I've got about $100,000 in liquid assets. My mortgage is two thirds paid off. I drive a 14 year old car. It's not a bad life. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable. Um, last year, I had thirty-seven thousand dollars in income, and I got carried away at the end of the year. You know, I have like twenty different causes, and I keep finding others, and I get all this mail, and it's so hard to refuse. Um, so, out of that thirty-seven thousand, I gave away ten thousand. Now, that's like twenty-seven percent of my income. I can't keep that up. Um, Usually I give away um, around 6,000, um, five, 6,000. I think one year I gave away eight. So you know, if I get $40,000 a year in income and I give away five or six, that's like 12 and a half to 15% giving. That, that's fine with me, that's good. I'm, you know, I'm not gonna try to do any more because if I keep it up, I'm gonna be asking for charity rather than giving the charity. Um, so I grew up in a very poor family and not, nothing gives you more empathy for the poor than being poor, just like, you know, health problems. When someone has a health problem, they can really empathize when somebody else that has the same health problem. And the same thing with being poor. So um, my mother uh, was a domestic. Uh, she worked at uh, some of the time at a downtown Chicago hotel for pitiful wages. And we used to celebrate when she got a, uh, a tip, which is pretty rare. Um, and sometimes that made a real difference for us. Anyhow, 
father was alcohol alcoholic. He left the house when I was 12 and provided no support, nothing. Um, so I learned how to live without money and I learned not to envy, at least on a conscious level, people that had things. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much that same way. Uh, maybe it's refreshing. I don't know, but um, it works. So um, I found this remarkable, that the poor give 4.6% of their income to charity. The poor do that. That's amazing to me. And it's so inspiring. And I've seen that. I remember working at a hospital guy coming in and paying a bill for one of his neighbors who didn't have the money. So, you know, it's, that's good stuff. That really is. Um, so, and I, you know, I got to qualify what I'm doing by saying I don't have kids and grandkids and things like that to worry about. Um, so I'm free and easy in that sense. And uh, that doesn't make a difference. You know, if you had a, you got a couple of hundred dollars and um, you think about getting something nice for your for your daughter uh, and then you think about giving it to charity, that's that's kind of a tough decision. You know, there, there's got to be some ambivalence there. Um, so where is Oliva? Singer admits he could do more, I could do more, we could do more, and we absolutely should do more. If one is to subscribe to an ethical life and claim to be such a person, then one should try to live it as full as possible. And I submit it is both a responsible and a, a responsibility and an ethical choice to do that as much as reasonably possible to prevent children and adults from dying from lack of food, no matter who they are or where they are or what the cause may be. You know, the notion of giving did not start with Singer. There are 7,000 references to this in the Bible. The Talmud says gives 10% of your income to charity. Um, uh, Islam requires a 2.5% donation of your assets, not your income. So that's pretty stiff. As Singer mentioned, he has a scale starting at 5%, which I think is pretty reasonable. So, um, yeah, and this, to wrap it up. And like all kinds of good deeds, think giving is not purely altruistic, or should it be? There is evidence that giving makes one happier and life more meaningful, as he said. I experienced it through. And it's not just a feeling, there's, there's, there's evidence. There are studies, like from the NIH, that altruistic emotions and behavior are associated with greater well-being, health, and longevity. And it, it's they say it's good to be good, and science says it's so. So research studies demonstrate that people who help others usually have healthier, happier lives. So that's the payback. Um, so think about it. Follow your ethical conscience and values and your pocketbook. And thank you for listening to me today. Okay, I'm going to ask you not to go too far away. Because very shortly, we will be doing an exciting question and answer session. And hold on. To get my next page here. Just as a reminder, we are an all volunteer organization. And speaking of doing donations, we do pay rent for this room and have other various costs. And we are working on some more ethical actions, which also sometimes cost, which is why Fred is coming up here to pass exciting baskets around. And in the meantime, while he does that, I will remind everybody we do have ground rules for QA which is we want you to raise your hand rather than just shouting. Wait for the microphone. This is really important because our high tech mics here have a Zoom mic on them and we want the Zoom audience to also be able to hear. One question at a time, let everybody else get a chance to answer questions. In other words, if you have asked a question and Hugh has answered you and you whip your hand up again, it won't matter until everybody else gets a chance who wants to ask. Just sort of standard stuff. So we're going to bring Hugh back up for question and answer.
Okay, lay it on me. Who has questions? Uh, if you uh, take the mic, please try to hold it like this so we can hear. Hey, you. Um, this is not so much a question as it is an observation. And I think the whole paradigm of giving money uh, is kind of narrow in one regard because there are people who give money and people who give time. And to follow up on your revelations, the most money I ever earned, and it was my fault, I chose to be a journalist, it was $40,000 a year. And that was as recent as 2006. So I am not in a position to give vast sums or even small sums to most people. Chris knows how little I give to EHST. That's why when I come, I put a little in the basket. But what? how does that framework allow for people who give of their time? And that's what I do. I, I have a number of volunteer things, you know, some of which you know. And I try to give my time, whether it involves my expertise or just chopping onions or browning food for a meal or something like that. And um, I don't I don't feel guilty about that, but I'm just saying this whole focus on give part of your income or your money and people who are retired like I have no income except from Social Security. Um, so that is a little bit limiting this this whole argument to me. It's yeah, kind of criticism. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I agree. And actually, um, in, in drafting that uh, paper, I, I thought about that, and I should have included uh, some comments on that. But sure, I mean, there are people who do a lot of volunteering, many people that do a lot of volunteering. And I think um, certainly in your situation, that's that's adequate in terms of um, uh, giving. Um, I would say, though, if you had money, um, and we're volunteering, but still had money that you could afford to give it, you should, yeah, it would be good to give it. Um, but yeah, I mean, giving time is, you know, giving part of your life. And that's certainly, that's certainly a very important way of giving. Yeah. Thank you and everyone. I wanted to mention then, along with helping starving children, as you all know, my daughter, who is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, uh, was the chair of Palestinian Children's Relief Fund for more than 12 years and mm -hmm. headed up all of the, the work in Palestine and Gaza. She was there when the crisis. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And finally is home safely with one colleague. The others didn't make it. However, the person who started Palestinian Children's Relief Fund Steve Sosobi um, and my daughter and some other uh, colleagues, which works like Doctors Without Borders, it's international, are now starting a new organization that is a model that will serve today's crisis. It's called Heal Palestine. And uh, when I get the website uh, to send to everyone, I will. And they're able to right now, in fact, because I won't describe how, um, so that the IDF doesn't knock them out, we can still get formula for infant in, into Gaza that is in cans so people don't have to look for water which isn't there and, and use polluted water. But there are, we're setting up um, an orphanage because there are 17,000 today uh, orphaned Palestinian children, starting from tiny infants. Well, I heard 25,000, yeah. And, and probably more. Um, so they will need a, a safe place for education, medical care, and to keep them away from, you know, child trafficking and so on, which we know goes on in the world. Anyway, that is the new organization to serve today's needs in West Bank and especially Gaza. And I'll send that around because this organization has been really great in supporting uh, all of that in the past. And thank you.
Ken? Thank you very much for that comment. Um, I want to follow the first speaker because I think he brought up a very good point. Uh, and I know lots of people with disabilities who are poor and earn less than um, the 14580 a year. Um, some of them have assistance, some don't. But a lot of them give their time and it helps. Um, I do, I'm glad you mentioned multi this. It, uh, this dimensional uh, poverty, because I'm going to look that up because uh, the original U.S. poverty law that I developed in 1964 or so was, um, is, I think, it's inadequate. Now we're kind of war on poverty. So, yeah, giving time is a lot. And there are other ways, I think, to solve problems. Maybe uh, we have to look at you know, many causes of poverty, including the issue of population uh, growth. But I don't want to say a lot more about it because people are too about that. Um, I, I just want to make a comment. Thank you for um, your talk today. It's really good. Um, one thing I will say is that I, my only feedback is that I, I worry um, about local causes of poverty and people writing checks for people who they don't really have to see or touch or feel or be around. Um, I know that, you know, there's enough poverty to go around. <laughs> we have enough to worry about. Uh, but there is so much that happens right here. Putting on um, my case manager hat, there was a time where there was a family who was stealing food from different community gardens. And of course, the, the people from the community gardens wouldn't, you know, do anything. They were like, this is why we grow this stuff. But those are people who are not really seen, but they do need help. Um, and they do need support. And there are a lot of people who are right here who need support. And so um, like companies like GiveWell, who do a, a phenomenal job of vetting out uh, uh, organizations that actually have an impact, um, it, it would be good to see those local entities. You know, we do have some organizations who do the same kind of vetting, uh, but supporting some of the local as well. Um, and it's a shameless plug, but that's part of why I support the crop walk, especially when in Durham, because they do split that uh, funding between local charities and international charities. So that way they're they're helping with the footprint here as well as overseas. And so, you know, just wanted to make that comment. Yeah. Um... Oh, I have a flyer, right? So. The Crop Walk is a hunger walk. Um, there is gonna be one on March 24th in Chapel Hill. And this is just a walk that uh, takes donations and uh, raises awareness about hunger. So, um, you know, just a, another organization to think about. Yeah, and I, and I agree. Um, you can't uh, forget about the poverty in America. <clears throat> it's like 13.8% uh, 13, 13 on the multidimensional uh, scale. Um, um, I give more um, overseas uh, simply because um, people are dying over there. And um, while we do have serious malnutrition here, um, there aren't people, at least in a dramatic sense, dying from the way they are over there every day. Um, so that's why my uh, emphasis has been overseas. But the number of uh, charities I give to, they do both. They, they do both, as you um, as you mentioned. They, they give here and they give overseas as well. Maybe the bulk of it overseas. Um, yeah, you know, as far as um, checking out charities, uh, I've done a lot of that. Um, and you can get a lot of information from Charity Watch or GuideStar. They'll tell you how much salaries people are getting. There was a couple here in Durham taking $200,000 a year for running a Goodwill branch. So those are things that, you know, um, and they'll tell you how much they spend on programs. Um, every nonprofit has to file, and I've filed many of these, uh, a 990, Form 990, which really, it goes to the IRS, so it's pretty straight stuff, uh, and it'll tell you all about the the finances of a of a nonprofit, and that's worth doing. Yeah.
Yeah, I was just going to point out the uh, change for change jar is for the crop walk, correct? Oh, sorry, North Carolina Bail Fund. So uh, we do have that um, available. Any um, other comments? I'm going to go to folks who haven't um, made a comment, and then we'll get back to you. I just actually wanted to mention something. I think one of the things that was pointed out was that people say there's 19,000 kids dying all the time, and what can I as one person do? But it's really the same argument people make when they don't vote. And I think both of those are really important. I just wanted to put a little bit of feedback in. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, agree, I agree, sure. Hi, thanks. I thought that was an excellent talk. And I, I also wonder, you know, because I think a big part of it is that giving to other people and doing things for other people does make you healthier and happier, that's for sure. But I wonder if there's any research about whether you're more healthy and happy if you give locally or you're more healthy <laughs> and happy if you give far away. And I just thought that would, might be interesting, but I don't know if anybody knows about that. You know, probably if you were giving uh, specifically to a person helping them, that probably have a more impact in that sense than something more abstract. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting question. I have no idea. I, I don't believe there are any studies on that. Right, we're going to take two more quick questions and we're going to have to cut it off. Uh, while you were um, uh, during an early part of the program, uh, I got curious when he mentioned his website, which was you can save a life.org. So I went there and there is a calculator that you can use to calculate you tell it your income and it'll give you how much things you should give. And I didn't put in the percent that I wanted. It just defaulted to 1.8%. And I could certainly give that of my income. So you know, 5% might be a goal that we could reach for, but we can certainly do something. Um, uh, and hopefully over time we can, can give more. Um, but I think, um, yeah, if you only if there's a hundred thousand people, well, nineteen thousand children dying a day, if if you can give enough to get that down by fifty, is that wasted money? No, of course not. Yeah, you know, but I I I like the five percent because I think the five percent hurts, and then when it hurts, you know you're giving in a meaningful way. <laughs> last last comment. Uh, yes. Um, well, there's a lot of senior poverty in this country, uh, at least measured by maybe the American uh, Poverty Index. And uh, maybe a third of seniors live only in Social Security, which in the future will be diminished because fewer people apparently getting good jobs. There's so much stuff on the working on the economy. Uh, defined benefit pensions have gone out to defined contributions. So I think it's going to be more probably all along. So what what is the is there a multi-dimensional measurement of senior poverty in this country? Do you know? I'm sorry, I missed the dimensional measurement of senior poverty, because I've seen issues maybe one third of seniors live in poverty or so many, but uh, I don't know how it's calculated. And so given the inconsistencies between the way we traditionally measure poverty in and the multi-dimensional measure, I just wondered if we know how many seniors are calculated to be in poverty using multi-dimension. Yeah, well, that's a good question. I don't I don't know that offhand, but it'd be something worth pursuing. Yeah, I think that sometimes I've probably read that, but I, I don't remember specifically the number. Um, I want to mention something about, I passed around the, the, the photos, and I sent a photo, or rather, um, Tragic photo out um, uh, to uh, to folks. Uh, I think I did it yesterday about this child um, in Africa who was clearly starving to death. Um, a vulture in the background waiting for the child to die, and a photographer taking that picture. So the interesting story on that. I did some more research on it. The photographer who took that picture, a man named Carter actually committed suicide four months after he, um, after that incident. He took a lot of heat because he did nothing to save the child except chase the vulture away. And um, I found out, however, the child made it 
to the feeding station on its own. Well, I don't know whether it's completely on its own. Made it to the feeding station and got to bed, survived, and lived to the age of 14 when, unfortunately, he died from a virus. And uh, the child was not, as it was first described, a girl. It was a boy. Yeah. So I just thought might you be interested in that background. Thank you, Hugh. Hugh, that was a, um, the whole talk was good. And it was, I, I don't know of anybody else, but I certainly learned stuff, which is part of the reason I like coming to these. So we really appreciate that you gave this talk. Um, we do have announcements next because I'm standing here with the mic. I get to go first. So um, next week, same bat place, same bat channel. In-person hybrid Zoom meeting here next Sunday. And we will have Jim Bowie, who is a native North Carolina, North Carolinian, talking about, is the US headed for civil war or just a political shift? Um, I think that's gonna be a really interesting talk. We will be sending out the little email about it. And it's also on our website, ehstnc.org. And so we're looking forward to that. We have other things going on. I will just steal from Jennifer the fact that yes, we do have the change for change jar in the corner of the North Carolina bail fund. Because really, if you don't have any money and you can't get out of jail because of some charge that you may or may not even be guilty of, you can't support your family. You can't support anybody because you can't afford bond and therefore everything gets even worse. I, the, the system I think is a poor one, but in, in the meantime, while we try to change it, we're at least getting money so people don't have to suffer. Would that cover it, Jennifer? Yep. She's gonna put up, up another shameless plug for the crop walk. We are participating in the crop walk of uh, Chapel Hill, uh, Carborough, excuse me, uh, Chapel Hill and Carborough on March 24th. So we'll we'll continue to post that information in the mail champ, but I just wanna keep it on people's minds. And in <laughs> fact, the crop walk is another thing where you can give by money or give by doing or doing both because if you're not able to do the walk for some reason, we'll still have an in-person only meeting that'll just be a general discussion and you're absolutely welcome to fund the EHST team. If you are able to walk and wanna to come to the walk, then we will have an EHST team. So when you sign up, which I'm sure you will, make sure you sign up with us. Whatever other announcements do we have? Anything from anybody today? Okay. So since we have no other announcements that we are aware of, we're going to haul Jay back up here for closing words. Anybody who's uh, surfed online or done Google knows that it can be like a rabbit hole. You discover all kind of stuff you're re really looking for. And when I was looking up things about altruism and charity, for some reason I got uh, channeled to a site that had religious humor. And uh, so I'm not talking about altruism. No, I just thought I'd try to end with putting a smile on our faces. And a devout old shepherd lost his favorite Bible while he was out looking for a wayward lamb. Three weeks later, a sheep walked up to the shepherd carrying the Bible in its mouth. The shepherd couldn't believe his eyes. He took the precious book out of the sheep's mouth raised his eyes to heaven and exclaimed, It's a miracle. Not really, said the sheep. Your name is written on the cover. The church council met to discuss the pastor's compensation package for the coming year. After the meeting, the council chair told the pastor, We're very sorry, pastor, but we cannot give you a raise next year. You must give me a raise, said the pastor. I am but a poor preacher. I know, the council chair said, we hear you every Sunday. And fi finally, some words of wisdom. There's a very fine line between a long, drawn-out sermon and a hostage situation. Thank you, Jay. That was awesome. Okay. 
I would like to thank everybody who came and listened today and Hugh for an awesome talk and our visitors for coming in. We always appreciate seeing new people, even if they're from Philadelphia and not here. Um, also like to thank our greeters, Jean Rick and John Shaw for making everybody feel happy and comfortable here. Thank you, Jay, again, for doing opening and closing words. I always look forward to, to when you do this, just for the entertainment. And as I said, thank you, Hugh, for a fantastic talk and thoughtful answers to people's comments and questions. Amy, thank you so much as you trot the really interesting looking, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by the refreshments to the table. And finally, as always, I would really, really like to thank our Sultan of Zoom, Chris. Yay. Our meeting is over, but our fellowship continues. Please give a warm greeting to the person sitting near you. And as our microbiologist president would say, please wash your hands before refreshments. <laughs>